culture that we've had in here. Um, we have Dr. Kathy Takayama from Brown University. She's the director of the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning and professor of molecular biology, cell biology, and biochemistry. You have a whole sheet on Dr. Takayama. I will let you look over that. Um, and I'm going to let her take it away. Great. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, I'm really delighted to be here, and everyone's been so warm and generous, so I'm really enjoying my visit. Um, I love this, because no one ever sits in the front row, and that's what our <laughs> students do as well, <laughs> despite Leslie's efforts to put all the comfy chairs in the front. So if you want a comfy chair and you're in the back, there's plenty of room up the here. The ones in the front are cushioned. Yeah, they're really comfortable. So, um, so thanks for joining me today. I was invited because you know some of your colleagues had heard me speak at the ePortfolio conference, and I think some of the, the ways in which I tried to articulate my own personal challenges as a faculty member um, in getting my students to develop a sense of ownership over their learning and be comfortable with the ways in which they might question or, or be comfortable with not knowing was not something that is normally part of what we discuss in higher education. Because we talk about success and, and evidence of that success, and then how do we make that happen? So this is a very different kind of talk. But um, I, I really would love to hear some of your thoughts and ideas at the end of it. I, I hope that we can have some discussion. The notion of cultivating a learning culture for me means the ways in which we scaffold and really creating culture and community. And what that means for you in your classrooms, in your programs, in your disciplines. And how do you know when your students start to feel that they are part of that or they're creating a culture for themselves? So I start off with a quote by the professor of the year, the Case Carnegie Professor of the Year in 2008, uh, Michael Wesch, who's from uh, Kansas. And um, he really gave this wonderful talk at a conference. And he talked about, he started off by saying, you know, our schools are still organized around answers rather than questions. And that resonated very, very strongly with me. Because I know that even though we really are trying to get students to ask great questions, and it's so satisfying and joyful when they ask you a very challenging question, we don't really necessarily constantly remind them that we're rewarding them for this or that this is really important to us because the ways in which we, meaning higher education, and I think high schools as well, reward our students is by demonstrating to us that they know the answer or they've gotten to the answer. So how might e-portfolios help our students live the question? And what does that look like? Because living the question is not something that's in the syllabus or the ways in which we think about designing our courses and our assignments, or even the experiences. Because we really are trying very hard to get students to develop a process whereby they create a way to figure out the answer or the analysis or the synopsis. So, E-portfolios can create learning spaces for metacognition. And learning spaces, I mean both figuratively as well as sort of community-based collaboratively. And so if we think about what that means, the process of metacognition, that is thinking about thinking and developing students' awareness of what that process looks like, means that we need to make it visible for them and then we need to take pause ourselves in recognizing that process and then letting our students know that this is valuable, this is valued, failure is valued, and we want to help them understand how it is that they learn from failure, and allowing them to take time to take pause. It's really, really difficult today because no one has time to pause. <laughs> So the ideas in the talk that I wanted to touch on have to do with validating uncertainty as an, a crucial element of lifelong learning and inquiry. And what does that look like? 
and how do we make our students comfortable with uncertainty as a very, very important element in their learning. And then I'd like to walk you through what I struggled with and then the way in which I developed this process in my own course of the collaborative e-portfolio, which was constructed as a developmental learning space for metacognition, for students to think about their thinking, not just by themselves, not reflecting only on their own, but in community. And then through that process, starting to form a disciplinary identity now this is interesting because I was trying to do this in an introductory level course, which one would argue it's a bit too early for students to develop a disciplinary identity if they're taking an intro microbiology course in my case. But for me it was really important because that was the start of trying to get my students to develop the sort of baby steps of habits of mind of thinking like a scientist. So we like to bandy this term about thinking like a scientist. What does that mean, right? And the students think that, well, they have to do X, Y, and Z because that's what they think we want to see as evidence of their thinking like a scientist. So they tend to focus on showing what they know as opposed to being open and comfortable with showing how they don't know and what they're trying to do to get through those bottlenecks. And then I wanted to sort of just put out for you what does transformational learning look like through transitional experiences across collaborative inquiry. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean collaborative inquiry as this is an assignment and you're going to work on a group project and this is how you're going to you know, really, really engage in meaningful deep learning in the course. But collaboration could be very much beyond the course itself. How do we help them make owner, take ownership over their learning, make meaning, and be architects of their experience as undergraduates? So let's break down some of the, the physical as well as sort of conceptual barriers of the notion of a course as an individual unit. It happens here, and then basically you're on to another course, and you're thinking about something else and you're not trying to create connections or creating connections extracurricularly to what you're doing in the formal academic curriculum. So Flavel defines metacognition as thinking about one's own thinking, which means planning how to approach a learning task and then monitoring one's comprehension in this process but also, just as importantly, evaluating the process and the progress of learning. So metacognitive, those students that, are really, that have high metacognitive skills really do very well in the long run because they're aware of their limits and then they understand how it is that they need to modify their approach in relation to their cognizant of the ways in which they're learning, whether they're really learning, deep learning. So their, mo their, their motivation is not always extrinsic, but they have this process of learning how to do this. Some students have had practice. Maybe they were lucky, and they experienced courses that really scaffold this scaffolded this process. But other students who have very poor metacognitive skills may be able to get high grades if all they're doing is memorizing and they figured out how to do well and get an A, but they're not deeply, deeply learning. There's a lot of work by Carl Wirth in, at McAllister University who's, who's done a lot of uh, experimentation with metacognition with his own students. He's a geological, a geological sciences professor and you know, has shown, not only him but his colleague who's a Spanish professor, the ways in which if you build metacognitive skills, students really start to do better in deep learning and, and longer term retention. Um, those students who have poor metacognitive skills will overestimate their understanding and they haven't figured out how to learn. So, the reason why this is a point important is because a, a very seminal study came out in 2000 by Bransford and colleagues. Um, 
sponsored by the National Research Council. And it was basically looking at across institutions with thousands of subjects, interviewing faculty, how it is that people learn and what are the facets that are absolutely critical for deep and meaningful learning. And so through this, the, one of the, the key outcomes of the study was that a metacognitive approach to instruction can really help students to take control of their own learning because they're defining their learning goals. So they're defining it. They're not looking at a syllabus and saying, OK, these are the things I have to do for this course. And then also monitoring their progress in achieving them. And then if we connect Ku's work on high impact practices to this process, then we might consider, well, how is it that metacognition can be integrated such that high impact practices, as defined by Ku, can naturally scaffold this process? Because one of the challenges I think that I've encountered and my colleagues have encountered is that we know things like authentic research experiences, first year seminars, meaningful internships, those sorts, and, and deep writing intensive, writing across the curriculum type of experiences are high impact. But oftentimes we struggle with how to unpack that so we can help students monitor their own process of learning as they're engaging in this. The students experience it, they're transformed, and something happens, but not all of them have really recognized their process of thinking as they're developing through these processes. And in particular, with collaborative learning and authentic inquiry, which is something that's very important to my field in the sciences, this requires both integration of metacognition into this process, as well as the ability to, through a group process, start to question each other and get feedback. And these are very, very complex things. I think that one starts to develop this naturally only because you go through this entire career of study, of graduate study, becoming a scholar, and with each level, you're practicing this, and you're just kind of learning it by doing it. So it's very difficult for us to be able to, in the short span of a single semester, or even in four years, get students to think in the ways, to become acculturated into the disciplines, and think of the ways that we do, which are so natural habits of mind to us. So how do we scaffold that? And how do we make it visible to them? And how do we make it visible to us? Um, Brett Einan and Laura Gambino, who are uh, based at um, LaGuardia Community College, they have been sponsors, uh, leaders in what's called the Connect to Learn project, a very broad-based e-portfolio project. And one of the things that's so critical in the ways in which they're trying to implement this on a very, very large scale across institutions, across programs, is reflection in community. And that social pedagogy piece is so critical, particularly for the ways in which their institutions work, where there is a very high attrition rate. And students have very, very important lived lives that are, take priority over their studies in an environment like a community college. And this work is important even to research universities like ours because they have shown us what it means when you take students who are sometimes they are motivated because they want that opportunity to change their lives, but they have all of these pressures on themselves that is very challenging to try to stay motivated because everything else is trying to pull them away from these tracks. And the ways in which they've constructed these social pedagogies and communities have made a huge difference institutionally and nationally in the way students start to find community and create community and make meaning of how everything all fits together. So Savin Baden 
talks about learning spaces as opportunities to reflect upon and analyze one's own learning positions. And what she means by learning positions are certain points at which there is this cognizance of a transformation taking place. And sometimes it might make all the difference between hitting a wall, a bottleneck, and, and then sometimes we might think of these as threshold concepts. But then figuring out what is my process of learning? What are my assumptions? So it's not about conceptual understanding and working through a problem. But how, it is, how is it that I'm thinking about this discipline? What, is, what are my assumptions about mathematics? Or what are my assumptions about biology or literature in relation to what I'm trying to understand? And how do I position myself in relation to what I see as a particular trajectory that I've mapped out for myself. Students don't think like this because they don't have any reason to. This is not the way in which we've introduced them to higher education. But when they start to develop that sense, then in some ways they are developing metacognition on a bigger scale. But they really, really get engaged because now they feel like they're in control. And they feel like there are choices that they can make. And they're trying to create connections. And this is what these connections look like for them. So Barnett says, knowing is the position of realizing and producing epistemological gaps. Meaning that you and I are in this position because we understand what we don't understand or what's not understood in the field. And we have a sense of or our own limitations in relation to that. But we know what we have, one would have to do, right? whether it's us personally or the field needs to do to address this. Or we're cognizant of the different schools of thought or the different areas of specialization. And we have all of this mapped out, which is why expertise gets in our way sometimes. Because all of this is just so facile to us which makes it all the more harder for us to get our students to recognize that their way of thinking is one subset or sub sub subset of so many different complexities in our disciplines. And we're trying to help them walk through that. So this kind of knowing produces uncertainty. And we are comfortable with uncertainty because we know how to get through that. But uncertainty is absolutely frightening for students because that is the last thing they do not want to be there. Uncertainty, failure, not knowing. Because all they've been rewarded for all their lives is to show what they know. So could the e-portfolio be a collaborative learning space? Could it be a space that validates uncertainty for our students? Could it be a space where they start to discover what their own personal learning positions are or those of their peers and how they relate to that or what they think about that? And could it be a space where students start to be a little bit comfortable with living the question as opposed to constantly seeking the answers? So here's my case study. I taught this course, an introductory microbiology course, at my previous institution for over 10 years. And it was a prerequisite to every single major in the life sciences. It had 280 students in it. And so this is it's a research intensive university. Um, just to give you some context, it, in Australia, there are what we'd, we would call the top eight research tier institutions. UNSW is one of them. They particularly um, focus on the sciences, although they, they do have uh, humanities and, and creative arts divisions as well. But it was incredibly challenging for me because the priority for everybody is, is research. The students themselves are trying to get into the best laboratories. This course is a feeder course for so many others, and it forms the foundations 
of everything else that has to happen. It's an incredible stress on the faculty member who teaches this course because you, you bear the responsibility of making sure that they are all set to move on and progress in several different majors. There are two lectures a week, what we call one recitation and tutorial, and one laboratory, which is about three to four hours. And the students stay in the same group between the recitation section and the lab section. And as with any large course, it's pretty much, well, I thought it was impossible to create a personal, meaningful experience for students. You're, you're just in this course, you have to get through it. And, um, but there's a lot to get through. One of the things that's imperative, though, is for students to understand how to develop their research skills. Because from the second year, they already have to engage in research projects within the course. In this course, they are not only developing the fundamental skills in the laboratory, but they're also embarking on a semester-long research project in groups. So there's a double challenge. And what they are supposedly doing is connecting what they're learning in the lectures to what's happening in the research laboratory. And they're supposed to figure it out on their own. If we think about the process of scientific inquiry, and some of you have heard this in the previous session with the STEM faculty, it was in very, very frustrating for me because the students had a very different notion of what inquiry was about from what all of us who are practitioners know what inquiry is about. But if I looked at the representation of inquiry in textbooks and different kinds of manuals, it's depicted as a very linear process whereby the focus is completely on the conclusion. So there you go. We're rewarding them for the answer. So students at a very early stage believe that inquiry is about getting to the answer and getting there as quickly as you can. And even if the methodology or the argumentation is flawed, so long as they came up with the right answer, that's OK. And that meant that they were thinking about inquiry in a very different way from practitioners and professionals, meaning that there's a serious discrepancy between the practice of authentic inquiry and the pedagogy of inquiry. So that was what embarked me on the ePortfolio process. Because I did a mea culpa and said, you know, there's something seriously wrong with this, with this course. And I foolishly said, OK, I'm going to change it. And for a while, I tried to think about the ways in which you know, this was going to happen. As with any course, I continued to tweak it over the years. But essentially, this is where I wanted to go. I wanted to create, get away from the linear model, and get students comfortable <laughs> with going around in circles um, in an iterative process, whereby they were completely engaged in the journey. And that's what it was about. And they didn't have to worry about the end point. Because so long as they could critically evaluate it, then that was what the process of inquiry was about. At the heart of all this is a very interactive process. And this is where a community comes in. Because we don't do this on our own in isolation. We do this in community. Regardless of what field you are, you are part of a broader community whereby you are trying to express, get feedback on, critique, engage in the discourses of our disciplines. So I embarked on this process, which I'm calling metacognitive folio thinking, where I thought an e-portfolio can help us map the learning process throughout the entire course. This is different from other kinds of e-portfolios where students are creating their own individual portfolios. And I know many of you have been doing some terrific work here. And then collecting different kinds of artifacts that demonstrate their reflection on this process, the reflection of what they've learned, trying to connect their different experiences. In this case, the reason why it was particularly challenging was I was trying to get this to happen in a community, in a group of students. And I saw that collaborative e-portfolio as being the organizing principle for the entire course. 
meaning that all of these other components, the lab, the online discussion groups, they did have a journal, um, discussion lectures, were supposed to be tied together through that process of reflection and iterative engagement through the collaborative e-portfolio. What this meant was that the way in which the initial prompts were set up for the students as they started to put together these group portfolios was dependent on conditional language, meaning that there were words that they encountered which were not part of the vocabulary of what we usually had in science assignments. There were words like, what have you found so far? Or what is your initial approach? Or um, what, how you might identify steps or topics you were unsure of, and how you might seek guidance in clarifying these areas of uncertainty. So it took us a while to get the language right, but every one of these prompts had to hit that right tone where we were validating uncertainty, but still allow them to feel like they were going to be making a step, progress. And there were a few versions of this because we really had to play with the language for a while, but this was the final language. Again, things like what questions or concerns does your group have, and then having them take ownership over it, what will you do next to address these questions or concerns, also allow them to take pause and say, you know, this isn't all about showing us what your research project was going to be about, how you're going to collect the data, and what you hope to find. But let's value the group. Let's value the concerns, the community. But then you own it. And at this point, what do you think you might do to address that? So this was the scaffolding process. And I called it language that validates not knowing, because I wanted them to be comfortable with not knowing. It also involved my team, my TAs, and I to be on the same page with this. We had weekly TA meetings where all of us would discuss what we saw as small steps, evidence of our groups in feeling comfortable with not knowing, being comfortable in that liminal space. So what happens is there are three submissions. And if anyone's interested in, in these links, I'll email them to you. But instead of saying, show us your portfolio at the end of the course, which again is that linear approach, it's we just want to check in with you at several times during the semester. And we want to give you feedback, but we want you to give each other feedback in this process. So they didn't felt like the portfolio was this culminating huge project that they had to deliver. It was all about mapping. It's all about, we're just going to peek in. We're taking the pulse. And that also made the big difference, because it didn't seem like this high, high stakes project that they're working on. So what metacognitive folio thinking does is it validates uncertainty as part of the learning process. And some of the language that they were using in the online discussions also gave us insight into, OK, so how are they thinking about this? So you know, they, they contaminate stuff all the time. Um, one of the challenges is, is when you're working with first year microbiology students, they, they don't understand that the hardest part of being a microbiologist is learning how to culture things without contaminating. And so even though they're supposed to be culturing bacteria, they'll get everything. Or they'll have fungi. They'll have all kinds of stuff. And it's colorful. And you know, you just kind of think, OK, let's go back. But, and they would get very stressed out of, about this because they think that this is something that is so easy they'll get it down in one week. But it started to change. Their stress started to change once we started doing this because they realized that, OK, you know, Let's just figure this out. And, and they would think about these things. They would refer to the e -post, I called it an e-poster rather than an e-portfolio because I wanted them to feel like they were scientists and you know we talk about posters in science. So they would refer to that. And they started to be aware of their particular learning positions in where they were. They were 
um, no longer stressed out about making sure that they had this full-fledged project to deliver and package with the pure culture and the genus identified, which was their research project, because they were quite comfortable in wherever they happened to be in the process. And so as they move through the learning positions, um, what happens is they, they have these transitional experiences. So there's a shift in the learning experience. And you start to recognize it when you see it. And then there are challenges to the person's life world at different times and in distinct ways. And what this leads to is transformational learning, a, a sense of coming into oneself and a sense of identity construction. Sometimes this really is exciting when you see it in writing. When students move through this transformational experience in their writing, and initially, they, their voice isn't you know, quite there, or they're not quite sure who their audience is, and, or sometimes it is fairly pedestrian. And all of a sudden, you start to see this transition happening where they have this ownership over their voice, right? That voice starts to develop. And, and then whatever that identity is starts to come out. And the exciting thing about these e-portfolios, it actually makes all of this visible. If it's developed as a process of making all of this visible for our students and for ourselves. So if you think about in my context where I was trying to do this with groups, with fairly large groups, there's the personal knowing that's happening for each of the students. And that was really clear from their journals and what they were posting on the discussions. But then there's this collaborative knowing that's starting to build. And the two are interacting. And then they start to feel like, OK, here's my identity. But then I'm part of this community. And it's, this community is really important to me. Because these are the ways in which I'm negotiating my position with, within the community. Because students, normally you, you have, OK, you say this is group project, and students always groan because they hate group projects. But now they were, this was their team. So I, I feel like what happened was we moved from being a group to a team. And the ideas evolved cyclically. They really reflected and contributed. There was a lot of exploration beyond the formal course, where they start to create connections between their personal lives, between other courses, between what they were reading in their humanities courses to what was happening in the microbiology course. They would tell me about their cousin's food poisoning. Um, you know, things that, that started to make sense in what they were trying to figure out with the microbial world. But they were very, what I loved the most is that they were so comfortable with not having to come with me, come to me and show me what they knew. But it was more about, you know, this is what happened. And what do you think? Or, or you know, they, they were, I guess, willing to take risks because they didn't feel that they had to show me how much they knew all the time. So they were celebrating questions quite a bit. Uh, I will say that the questions that come out, and I know that in there, uh, some of you had previously told me that it's really a delight when you get a great question from a student. And, and I felt that joy. This was wonderful, because I was getting terrific questions uh, outside the ePortfolio, just in the lectures themselves and a sense of self-authorship amongst the students as they started to develop their own frameworks of who they were in relation to the learning, the courses, the discipline, but other aspects of their development in university life. So e-portfolios can reflect, help us reflect and analyze learning positions. But then, you know, why are these spaces so important? Why is uncertainty important? And D Ruth Deacon Crick has done quite a bit in studying what she calls learning power. Um, I think this is slightly different from, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Angela Duckworth's work on grit. 
She was a MacArthur Fellow awardee uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And I, Ruth is based in the UK, but each of them have looked for you know, many, many years at the notion of what is it that makes certain kinds of students resilient and develop a sense of grit or staying power in spite of any kind of impediment, be it personal, be it learning, be it any, you know, different kinds of circumstances, and why is it that some students succumb? And they started to articulate measures of learning power or measures of grit. And so one of the things that Ruth Deacon Crick points out is those students that develop learning power also have developed higher metacognition in that they start to learn to learn, whether it's in life or in courses, because they start to form a learning identity and purpose. They have resilience, creativity, and curiosity. They're engaged in generating knowledge. And it could be something as simple as not only knowledge in an academic sense, but knowledge as in they're figuring out life lessons. And they're learning in an authentic context. They also, she also points out how critical it is to sustain learning relationships, not only social relationships, but learning relationships, and how students need to figure out what those learning relationships are and where they stand in those relationships. So if ePortfolios can help our students and ourselves also scaffold metacognition, then part of it is for them to develop a sense of resilience because they need to feel comfortable with uncertainty because they have that learning power. They know what they need to do to move through that uncertainty. So if we're trying to scaffold these processes, it doesn't happen with one assignment, but they need to develop these through sustained attention over time. I want to talk about a student of mine at Brown um, who I mentored for many years. And she was an anthropology and economics double major. She worked with me on a number of projects, one particularly in a major project we did in flipping in economics, a large introductory economics course. And she was sort of one of my head undergraduate teaching assistants. So at Brown, we, we do use quite a number of undergraduate TAs in different courses. But I shouldn't use the word use. We actually partner with them because what they become are, are true partners with us in facilitating learning processes with peers. And they're part of our team in constructing the course, in giving feedback to us, and also continuing to help tweak the course. She was quite incredible because through the process of peer engagement and then starting to recognize her own epistemologies in relation to her peer epistemology, peers' epistemologies of the groups that she was facilitating, she became cognizant of the ways in which she was creating connections beyond her immediate majors and how this was helping her make sense of what her trajectory was going to look like what, where she want, not what do I want to be, but how she wanted to position herself in relation to the world. And so again, a sense of learning positions and what it was that she was still seeking. Interestingly, she decided that she might take a year. Ultimately, she does want to go back and get some, either a graduate degree or a law degree. But she decided to just spend a year out in the field. And so because of her background, she actually was a prime candidate in getting a job at some of these you know, high-powered firms in New York City. And um, so we talked a lot. And she you know, was interesting because she told me all about these, every single interview that she had. And a lot of times, you know, it's very stressful because there's a group of them. And you're sitting at the end of a table. And they're just barraging you with questions. Um, some of these are investment firms. They're very, very brutal. But they did not ask her these questions. Surprise, surprise. They didn't say, oh, what grade did you receive in your calculus class? Or what was your you know, topic of your 
ethnographic methods paper, right? We all know that. But that's what we're assessing. Um, every single firm said, what would you say are three greatest strengths? And how are your skills going to be valuable to us? Know your audience. Know your skills. And how do you contextualize that in relation to knowing your audience and knowing oneself? What are my strengths? Am I even aware of what my strengths are and what my teammates value me for? And what's my evidence of that? We don't teach our students to do that. We assume that they know it and they'll just be able to say it and do it. But I would venture to say that most of our professions, even if we're in academia, these are really important to us because I ask my candidates this when they come to interview for positions in my center. When I've sat on departmental search committees, we don't word it this way, but we're looking for this in how are you going to fit into our department um, in many different facets, research-wise, teaching-wise, student mentoring wise. So these broader soft skills and, and things that sort of need to be scaffolded, which are at the end of the day the most important things as you apply your contextual knowledge, are we're, we're not helping our students make raise that awareness and be able to articulate that for themselves so that they can articulate that for their colleagues and future employers. And so what are the ways in which we might help do that through e-portfolios? Because we have personal understanding, which includes tacit pre-understanding and then personal focus, but then there's social knowledge building. So, you know, we're not building knowledge by ourselves. We're always doing this in a broader context with our disciplinary communities, our professional communities. And in this process, there are different steps whereby we need to be able to communicate very clearly, but know our audiences and know ourselves in that process, but also go through a process, a negotiated process, sometimes of shared understanding so that there's collaborative knowledge. And this happens, we know, at the university level, at the disciplinary level, other professions as well. And so if these steps, these processes, are so important in success, then what are the ways in which we help scaffold that process through e-portfolios, or not necessarily e-portfolios, but just in general. What does that look like? So I would say that for me, the collaborative e-portfolio was a transitional space where there were shifts in experience, awareness of learning positions, um, true comfort with uncertainty, what I call liminal space. And I know that in the field of threshold concepts, for those of you who are familiar with threshold concepts, Liminal spaces are not places we want to be stuck in, right? We want to get through them to go beyond that bottleneck. But I'm using liminality in a very different sense, where liminality is a space of comfort with uncertainty, a pause for reflection, where things that we're not necessarily valuing start to come into place so that you actually recognize things that you normally would not have had you been so intent on getting out of liminality. So if it is a transformational space, transformational space, as I said, in identity construction, then I would say that it allows emphasis on the process of students being and becoming rather than simply expressing whatever pre-identified identities are established, whether they're supposed to be professional identities or what they think they're supposed to do and, and express as a major in X, Y, or Z. Sometimes the extension of folio thinking to other course components can happen 
in this process as well. And I had the privilege of learning about how this is happening here from some of your colleagues earlier in the day. Um, in my case, this is a, a journal type of uh, item in, our, in my course. So in addition to keeping a laboratory notebook, I asked students to keep a journal. And I didn't call it a journal. I called because they would have just went, oh, journals, we don't do journals. But I called it a bug book. Bug meaning a very endearing term for, micro, for bacteria that we microbiologists use. And so essentially the bug book was a blank book. And I don't know, you know, for those of you scientists, if you give a science student who's so used to having a laboratory notebook where there are grids, there's a format, there's a signature, there's a protocol in terms of how do you keep a good laboratory notebook, if you give them a blank book, it freaks them out completely <laughs> because they think, oh, this is not science. And we need clear parameters. But that was the whole purpose. That was another aspect of getting them into that, out of their comfort zones and saying, this is a bug book. And it's about your bug. So you really want to get to know it. And you can write anything about it over the course of the semester. You will still have a separate laboratory notebook. And it was interesting because initially, students, of course, are habits of creatures of you know, habits. So what they started to do was they started to replicate their laboratory notebook in the bug book. And, and we sort of, my tias and I said, well, you know, this looks just like your lab notebook. <laughs> So basically, you're going to get half the points <laughs> if this is what you think you're doing. Um, initially, points mean a lot to students. But I've, later on, I'll, I'll say that basically, they didn't really care about what anything was worth at the end because they started to really get engaged in the e-portfolio, which made all the difference for everything. But then all of a sudden, they, they went through that process of uncertainty and liminality. And then they started to develop this sense of freedom where they would put things like this. And it was, it was we, it wasn't me. Like, this is what I'm doing. But here are things that we did well, my team. And these are things that we can improve. Here's, so here's a student you know, telling, it's, it's her bug book, but she's saying, great job, everyone, by everyone. You know, I put back some feedback with room for people to add on stuff. I think it's important we evaluate how we went, what we can do better. And it was interesting because she just, started to develop this sense of no more borders, no more boundaries. And um, it was fascinating. Look, scalloped edges. I'd never seen scalloped edges in a laboratory notebook before. Um, <laughs> arrows all over the place. The reason why in science this is really crazy is because in scientific notebooks, we're not allowed to go back and re-annotate. Right? Or if you do, you initial it, and you sign it, and you date it. But you keep going, because everything has to be documented. And you will not change anything. But she's going back, writing comments, putting arrows, um, scalloping edges. But the interesting thing is that there's this sense of uh, marginalia. And you know, for those of you in the humanities, of course, you, you say, well, yeah, I'm like, you know, we do this. This is what we do. We annotate our books. And, and this is part of, of just normal practice. I will say for the sciences, this is quite extraordinary, because this is not the way in which science students and scientists annotate. And so. So I started to get fascinated with this, because when I you know, was showing one of my colleagues in English some of these bug books, he said, oh, yeah, this is you know, kind of just like marginalia. And so I started to look at all of this, this the, the history and, and the, the genres of marginalia. So Edgar Allan Poe happens to be you know, someone who really, really took marginalia to a high art form. And he wrote on it in the Democratic Review in 1844, on marginalia as a venue for elective discourse. In the marginalia, too, we talk only to ourselves. We therefore talk freshly, boldly, originally, with abandonment, 
without conceit. And I love that because that is what my students were doing in the bug books. And they had the freedom to do it because they were comfortable with not knowing. They were just comfortable being in that space. Sam Anderson in the New York Times writes, and he's another big fan. He's, I don't know if any one of you have seen his blog. He's, he kept a blog for several years on marginalia, and it's actually a podcast of each month by month. Because he, he says it's the most intimate, complete, and honest form of criticism possible, a moment-by-moment -moment <coughs> record of what a book actually feels like to the actively reading brain. And I wanted my students to think about what it feels like. I'm going to play you a very brief clip uh, on, from his, his actual website. And if you go to it, some of, this, some of his uh, recordings are quite great. So this one, I think it's from 2011. He's, he's going, so this is all of the books that he has reviewed over the year, or read over the year, over each year. And in April, he features The Pale King by David Foster Wallace. And he's, oh, and let me tell you that. So he's got the marginalia, right? And what he's doing in the podcast is he's reflecting on the reflection. So he's commenting on the marginalia that had, he had written at that point in, you know, in that part of the book. And I, that's something that I really want to use in my course, where I want to get my students to go back and reflect on the reflection. And unfortunately, I was afraid this was going to happen. We tested it right before the talk. But it seems like it is not happy. So we'll go on. But I encourage you to look at his website because it is great. One of the um, more humorous passages, he talks about He's referring to uh, some, one of the authors who apparently keeps using the same term over and over and over again. And in the margins, it says, if he says this one more time, I'm going to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. It's all raw. So, and I, and I do think that this, um, this whole process, the way students were doing this throughout all the other components of the course, would not be happening had they not been in the liminal spaces that the ePortfolio allowed them to be in. This was apparent in all the other components of the course as well. So the, the ePortfolio infiltrated into every aspect of their coursework. And it wasn't because I was telling them to do that. That is just the natural progression in which they started to learn to learn. So I, I told you that the groups became teams. They were reflective learning communities. And there really was a culture of peer learning and teaching. I absolutely know that there is deeper thinking. Um, I will say that the professor that taught the level two microbiology course after my course told me that it allowed him to start at a higher level. Because once I I sort of, after a few tweak, couple of years of tweaking, once I got this course right, then these students were coming in at a level so that he was able to eliminate a lot of the review that he had been doing prior. And not just conceptual review, but actual laboratory review, skill review as well. So he completely changed his research project and got them to do something far more substantive than he was able to do in previous years. And they focused on critiquing process rather than outcome. So really, they were able to let go of their anxiety about not knowing and thinking about uncertainty. So that's my story about living the question. Um, I really would welcome some of your ideas, your thoughts. I know that I have a lot to learn from all of you because the, pro the portfolio project here has been phenomenal. 
And you know, I'm, I'm just really deeply respectful of both Margaret and, and Leslie for all the work that you've been doing. So thank you for your time. We have time for questions. How did the changing around that class affect um, the final assessments of the students? Were they all you know, shooting above the grades they had previously earned, or was it did you change the way that you assessed the work they were doing then? Yeah, great question. I actually did change the way in which I was assessing because if I was changing the way they were learning, then I was able to raise my own bar a bit for much, much deeper, uh, more challenging types of assessments. So because of the sheer size of the course, I mean, I will admit to having to give midterm and final exams that were part multiple choice, uh, short answer, but then essay, which is killer because I graded 300 times five essays every year because each student had to write five essays in their final exam. Um, I was able to raise the bar on that essay. These questions were far more complex. They were open-ended. There was no right answer. And it was, it was hard. I mean, I will, I will say that it, it's a, a lot of work. But I had a great team. And the, I think the initial hard work was just trying to get it right. And then once everything sort of fit together, then all the other pieces fell into place. Um, the other thing that I'll share is that the e-portfolio was only worth 5% of the whole grade. And, and I got a lot of um, pushback from my colleagues who said, you know, that's just unethical because they're putting in so much effort for just five points. And I, I wasn't telling them or forcing them to put the effort in. What happened was they very quickly figured out that the more they engaged in the e-portfolio, the better they were doing in all of the other components of the course, meaning the short, we had short weekly conceptual quizzes. They had, um, so that the midterm, the uh, short laboratory reports, and, uh, and then also the lab tests that they were taking in the lab. And so they got clued into this fairly quickly because what they started to use the portfolio for was a study tool as well as you know, their project. So, so they put in a lot of effort because it helped them do better in everything else. Why did you value it over 5% of the course grade? I didn't think they put so much effort into it initially. Because <laughs> you know, I naively thought in the beginning that, OK, I'm going to try this crazy thing. But first, do no harm, right? So I thought, if I'm going to do no harm, then I better make it worth only 5%. And if it totally you know, is a failure, then it's not big stakes in the course. And, and I didn't want to make it optional or not you know, just kind of you either do it or don't, and you get a check. Because if I didn't have some kind of point value attached to it, then I, I didn't think they would do it. So that's the reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you have your students do quite a bit of writing. I just wondered if you talk a little bit about that with um, respect to <coughs> does writing help to produce a bit more metacognition, or is there a way in which you see it that way? And then part of my question, in addition to that, would be if there's something that the teaching of writing might contribute to that. So thinking about the link between a biology course, let's say, and a writing course, if there's any sort of interconnection you learn through your experience. Yeah, great question. Uh, for, for that particular uh, major at my previous institution, it was really challenging because, in terms of writing, because we had a lot, a high percentage of students who were not native English speakers. It, it was just the nature of the demographic that, you know, they, these were like the top elite students from Singapore, um, Thailand, and other, other countries. And um, so even though scientifically they were high, and mathematically they were high performers, it was hard for them to write the way in which we needed them to learn how to write as, as scientists. So, you know, but then, of course, we had very good writers. I mean, that's not true for every single student. There were some terrific writers as well. I had one grad student from Singapore who was absolutely brilliant. 
a brilliant writer. And I, I will say that I didn't teach the process of writing because I didn't feel qualified to be able to do that. But just purely through that process of writing and having their peers help to refine collaboratively, I think their writing did become better. I mean, I, I noticed that the lab reports were a lot better, and I know it wasn't plagiarism because I mean, we're, we were pretty you know, strict about keeping an eye on that. So, and, and we weren't so worried about you know, every single grammatical error or anything like that. It was more the structure, the, the argument, the critical thought behind it. And that started to come out, and that was really exciting for us. One of the things that you know, I would love, I'm trying to do uh, at my center is bring my associate director for sciences and associate director for the humanities together, and we're trying to develop a, a writing pedagogy program for faculty in how do you teach writing as critical inquiry in your disciplines. And I think the, the collaboration between the two of them is really, really important for, particularly for the scientists. Yeah. It doesn't sound to me like you <clears throat> invested a lot of energy in, in, in some of the things that the group learning people do to sort of ensure full participation by members of the group. I mean, I've got a friend in psychology who has a very elaborate scheme <laughs> group learning in his course, collaborative enough to be off-putting to me. Um, but maybe your students were motivated enough that all of them sort of discovered the value and, and bought in and you didn't need mechanisms to keep them all involved? Uh, initially I did uh, because I, you know, it's, before we started moving into the portfolio process, oh, we still had a, a group project and I would brace myself every year for, you know, when I announced the group project, there's a collective groan in, in the class. And um, I, I didn't do elaborate schemes, and, and you're right in part in that they, the e-portfolio project really made them into teams. And so, I didn't have to have all of these schemes to help them work that way because they figured out that if they weren't working that way, it wasn't, they, they were not learning. They weren't really sort of succeeding and they weren't happy, they weren't satisfied. I mean, they found great joy in working on this project together. Um, what the big important lesson I learned though in the second year, and that made a huge difference, is one gesture, but they, you know, they had all the guidelines for group projects, for, for collaboratively working on this, and they knew that they had to fill out a peer feedback, you know, at the end. And, you know, we all do that, and it wasn't really still, it wasn't really addressing some of the occasional slapper, you know, who was trying to ride on the coattails of everybody else. So in the second year, we asked them to write a group uh, contract. And each group had to take ownership for writing coming up with their own group contract in relation to the collaborative project in the e-portfolio. But we wanted still to allow, to give them permission for uncertainty, uncertainty in that we said, okay, you know, it's not set in stone. I mean, all sign on to it. But if you need to amend it during the semester and revisit it, go ahead and tweak it, but make sure you meet with the professor to kind of discuss it so that everyone has is on the same page. And that made all the difference in giving, empowering them to come up with a group contract in, in terms of what they thought this was about and how they wanted to engage in the process. And they, they all went through several revisions when they started to figure out what was working, what wasn't working. Thank you. Yeah. Along these lines um, of talking about writing, um, I've tried at times, I, I'm a microbiologist, um, and at times in, in my neonology you know, course, to start a topic or, or the lecture, or, you know, one of the problems I think is we spend all our time in science in the lecture telling them the facts and then say, go do the synthetic part on your own in your jammies by yourself, which is best evidence. 
you know, they can pick up the facts. It's putting it together that's tough. So I, I try to do that with these scenarios in class. So here's a cool scenario. Now, here's a few minutes. Talk with one another. What do you think is going on? And write it down. And the reason I've stressed writing it down is that I think that as they write it, it gets a little bit more involved and they find a problem, potentially. One of the things that, that happens, though, is that they won't write anything in the course notebook that they brought to class that I haven't said. I'm, I'm pleased that at least I'm getting them to talk. As I walk around, they'll talk, I'll come over and they'll say, Dr. Roberts, we're talking, and there's nothing written down. Do you think the fact that you created the bug book, that something about that made it okay I can play in the bug book? I've tried saying use the other side of the paper that you never write on, that that can be your play part. Um, but don't, I've walked up to students and said, draw it, write it down. And they're like, oh, no way. I'm waiting to go to the board. And the right answer goes into my notes. And, and I've seen other people talk about this. What do you think, or what's the strategy in a course class setting to overcome that it's OK to play in your notebook? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I don't, you know, I don't know if it was primarily because of the bug book, but I will say that it did change things around. Um, the bug book was implemented before the e-portfolio was implemented, right? So this course was sort of like a labor of love over time. And, <laughs> and so maybe because that was there as part of the course already, they, I mean, in some way they they found a little playground. So it wasn't such a huge jump into the e-portfolio. But it, you're right. I, I think for me, I still wanted to respect the laboratory notebook space. I mean, that is important. They need to know, you know what best practice is for many, many reasons, uh, professionally and ethically. But, but I, as you did, I needed them to not be afraid to play. And, and I couldn't do that. I mean, you know, I didn't have these active learning classrooms where you have all these whiteboards everywhere. They could play at the board, because that would be great. And that's what we're doing right now in our physics and chemistry and applied math courses, where students are not afraid, afraid to play. Because a whiteboard is, allows that you know, temporal freedom, mm -hmm. both physical and temporal, in terms of that play space. And, um, but because we didn't have that, I guess the bug book was, was that form. They were terrified at first, as, as I told you, because you know, it was just so unconventional. And you know, I mean, part of me was saying, because I mean, I'm, I'm a humanities groupie, right? I, I love humanities professors, and I'd like to hang out with them, because they <laughs> felt happy. Uh, because I have this silo so, you know, so much in my professional upbringing <laughs> as a scientist. And so I wanted to get my students all excited because I said, oh, but you know, you could, the bug book allows your bug to have a narrative. And they're like, bugs don't have narratives. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just by me being goofy, giving them the freedom to say, you know, just set aside your serious hat for a minute. You still have, you will become a serious scientist. But in order to do that, you have to be comfortable with playing and going beyond your little disciplinary box. Yeah. Um, Kathy, I'm sure that um, there are probably lots of other questions, but because there's such a mixed audience here, some of you are already involved in the ePortfolio project here, many of you are not. I want to underscore that the kind of portfolio that Kathy is showing us is different if you go to our website than the kind of outward facing professional end of your career portfolio that our project has been focused on. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't do this kind of portfolio or other elements of it to scaffold to the kind of com completed professional portfolio at the end. And in fact, lots of cohort departments are doing versions of what might, is sometimes called a learning portfolio, right? or even a class-owned collaborative portfolio. So please don't think that this doesn't apply to us. It, it certainly fits with our project. I was actually just about to ask Kathy to talk about what you see as the relationship between the kind of work 
and learning that you were describing and the professional outward facing kind of new portfolio that a lot of our programs and departments are looking for for students. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will say that some of my students in the in the course went on to develop their own personal portfolios, not because I told them to, but they were really proud with some of the work that they had done moving on from the course. And, and I think that I was surprised at how they were able to transition from these, this raw you know, learning style of portfolio to consolidating that into, OK, Here's what I've done, and this is what the, these are the ways in which I'm reflecting on how I've made connections between this. And I would say that that reflective piece was so strong in comparison to some of the other e-portfolios that I had seen at my institution, where students were just, you know, I mean, they, they were supported, but because they weren't living it, it as sort of daily life, that they sometimes did not quite have the opportunity to, to reflect as, as thoughtfully. So, you know, that was exciting to me. Some of those students um, went on to medical school, and um, I would want to be their patient, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think that taking pause and reflecting is really important um, <laughs> for doctors. <laughs> So, so I, I will say that, I mean, you're absolutely right in that this, this is a very different portfolio from the ways in which um, some of your projects and students have put forth ex in exemplary ways the, the culmination and, and the ways in which they've thoughtfully gathered their artifacts. But it, I think you could help that process. We're, um, one of the, so this is something I haven't mentioned before, but what we're, trying to embark on, and I don't know whether Auburn has a program like this, but uh, we have a summer bridge program for freshmen who you know, come from, and it's focused in STEM, who come from uh, underprepared under, and or underrepresented demographics because some of them have difficulty in staying in a STEM major if they don't have the ability to not just you know, develop them, I mean, some of them come in with like, top-notch calculus skills, but sometimes they don't have community and they find it difficult to form community. And so we've had the Summer Bridge Program for a no number of years. We're trying to ramp it up. We, we, because of financial issues, we can only take about 15 to 20 students a year and we're trying to ramp that up to about 50 to 60 students a year. And so, there are a lot of different types of uh, learn to learn processes that come into place, community building, living learning environments. But we're thinking about the e-portfolio as an opportunity for them to form community even before they come onto campus and to maintain that community. We'd like them to have their own e-portfolios as they, they sort of reflect on their, their trajectories and make very thoughtful, informed decisions about course choices and activities. So again, it's not necessarily something that you show your employer, but it's sort of a predecessor to what could become something that you show a potential employer or a graduate school. Those outward facing exemplary portfolios don't come full blown out of right. students. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of other work, and I think that our cohort members will have lots of versions of how that has to happen with lots of feedback and support and scaffolding and, and many of the other things that you're doing. Um, I know that we're, the hour is getting late. Um, please feel free to linger and talk with our guest. And um, if you have to scoot away, this might be a, a, an appropriate moment for me to say thank you so much for coming and thank you for your guests. Thank you for